When you start up a business, you'd frequently pick one of the three main accounting packages, QuickBooks, Xero, or Sage Business Cloud. But as your business grows, eventually you'll find these packages no longer meet the needs of your business. In this program, we'll be taking a look at what options companies have when they need to trade up business system software and highlight some of the challenges and pitfalls of migrating to a larger system. I'm Stuart Robb, Vice President of Third Stage Consulting. Third Stage is the world's leading independent advisors for technology-enabled business transformation and business system software. In 1985, when I started in the computer industry, there was very little in the way of technology to help the small businessman run his or her business or prepare their accounts. Yes, there's a software like this one on the Apple II, called VisiCalc, it was a very early forerunner to today's Microsoft Excel. Or maybe you might have had a computer program on a cassette to print an invoice or run a payroll. But apart from these, that was pretty much it. And things weren't much better if you were a huge multinational business either. There were large mainframe computers like this one from IBM, the System 370. But the accounting systems on those were written in COBOL and took huge armies of people to run and support. And then you had the accountants speaking a strange and mysterious language which included terms like double entry bookkeeping and trial balance and producing terrifyingly large bills every quarter just for answering the telephone. It was all little better than paper ledgers and quill pens. But then things started to change. Software companies began to emerge producing software to automate the accounting and manufacturing processes for large companies. One of those companies was called System Anwendung Product in der Data Verbeitung. I'm sorry, can we try that again? Okay, one of those companies was called System Anwendungen Product. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce this. And that was a problem, because in fact nobody outside of Germany could pronounce it, which is why today you might know them better as SAP. Founded in Germany in 1972 by five ex-IBM engineers, SAP has dominated the marketplace for ERP software in large corporations for nigh on 50 years. But the small business owner wasn't left behind either. In 1981, a student at Newcastle University took a summer job in a local accounting firm to write some software to help with their record keeping. His name was Graham Wiley and the software he produced he called Sage. Along with local businessmen David Goldman and NASA scientist Paul Muller, they grew Sage into a business that today is the third largest business software company in the world. More recently though, the com cloud computing revolution has allowed new players onto the field with software that can support small businesses, such as QuickBooks or Xero, and both of them are very good. They have modern, intuitive user interfaces. They're easy to use and have high levels of automation. They produce all of the accounting paperwork that accountants use to produce for a fraction of the cost, and they do it all instantly. Indeed, in order to find a product with a bank reconciliation capability as good as the one in QuickBooks or Xero, you'd usually have to look outside of enterprise ERP software such as SAP or Oracle and to specialist providers like Blackline. So in fact, the small business person is now very well served. But these products do have their limitations and many businesses find as they grow larger, they outgrow the QuickBooks or Xero platforms they've become used to and need something a bit bigger. What many businesses don't realize though, is that the next step up is a big one, and those that are unprepared for it can end up falling flat on their face. So you might be wondering how you know you've outgrown your ERP. Well, to illustrate this, let's take an example of an organization I did some work for a number of years ago. 
They had ended up with over 25 separate instances of their accounting package, one for each legal entity in the group. Their financial data was spread across nine separate databases and they employed a full-time management accountant just to manage all the intercompany transactions and to produce the monthly management reports. In fact, it took them longer than a month to produce them. Although their ERP supported multi-currency, it didn't support company hierarchies, or multi-book accounting, or cross subsidiary approvals matrix, and in fact the list went on and on. Indeed, the CFO reckoned that if the company continued to grow at its current rate, they would have needed more people in finance than in marketing, sales, and customer service combined. Clearly then, things needed to change. But along with many businesses in their situation, they didn't know where to start. They lacked any detailed knowledge about the products available on the market. They didn't know which ones might be suitable for their business, which of the alternatives might be a better fit, whether they should be in the cloud. But most importantly, they didn't have any idea how to go about selecting a new ERP or even which ones should be on the shortlist. And this is a business critical decision. Most businesses only change their ERP software once every 15 years or so. If you make the wrong choice, it's a very, very expensive mistake to make and one you'll be regretting for a long time. In order to make the right choice then, you have to understand not only the product's capabilities, but also know what right questions are to ask, to understand the way that suppliers behave, to know what a good discount or subscription contract looks like, in short then, you need the experience of doing ERP selections and lots and lots of it. So where do you start? Well, the starting point depends on the type of business you have. Some businesses operate in a particular industry sector which are served by specialist ERP software providers. This means that, in theory, you can get from a long list to a short list very quickly. If you do civil engineering, for example, then you want, might want to look at IFS or Daytel. If you specialise in pro professional services, then NetSuite OpenAir is probably the benchmark product for you. If you're in commercial real estate or residential property, then MRI or Yardi could be the right ERP solution for you. And if you are a merchant retailer, then Intact might be your next step. And by the way, that's Intact with one C, not to be confused, of course, with intact with two C's, which is an ERP that's owned by Sage. And I think now we know what's confusing. So if you're none of these, then it's likely you'll fall into the category of a general business. And those can be served by any one of an endless list of commercial ERP solutions. I'm looking here at a list of packages from Wikipedia. It's split into two sections. The first of which is called open source ERP software. Now in that list are 20 ERP solutions. And I've been involved in ERP software for nearly 25 years. And of that list of 20, the only one I've heard of is Odoo. And things don't get much better when you look at the list of proprietary ERP solutions either. There are 54 listed. And I would guess out of those 54, only around 10 software vendors probably support more than 90% of the companies in the world. Some providers, like Sage or Oracle, have several different ERPs, some of which are through legacy acquisitions and competing against each other, making the choice even more difficult. And there are more problems too. This list isn't even by any stretch of the imagination close to being complete. Intact, either with one C or two Cs, is missing from the list. And so is Daytel, and so is MRI, and so is Yardi. And so is Blue Pearl, which specializes in retail, and priority software. And, well, you get the point. There are hundreds and hundreds of different products all competing for your business. The question is which one to choose, which is almost impossible to answer. And then there's a the question of how much they cost and how easy it is to get them up and running. I'm going to put up a controversial proposition to you. In the 1980s, there used to be a saying, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. And there was a reason for this. It certainly wasn't because IBM hardware was the cheapest. It was both because, by and large, it always worked and there was always a guaranteed upgrade path. 
you'd never be standing in front of the board with egg on your face if your data center was full of blue cabinets. And by the same token, whilst it might seem better, cheaper, and more exciting to go for one of the 65 ERP solutions that no one's ever heard of, it's probably going to be a lot safer to go for, for one of the nine or 10 that most people in the industry have heard of, and probably still safer still to go from one of the top three, if there's no compelling reason to do otherwise. And those three most popular for SMB businesses are, it's exciting, isn't it? NetSuite, Microsoft Dynamics, and Sage X3. So congratulations to them. All these products are very good. Each has its own strengths and weaknesses, and depending on your business, one will be likely to a closer fit to your business needs than others. But the key thing is, there are lots of people who know how to use these products and lots of clever people who know how to implement them, meaning that the availability of skills is much less of a concern than it might be for an ERP from a provider that no one has ever heard of. However, even if you do decide to go for one of the three main players, there are still a couple of big surprises along the way. The first one that might surprise you is the cost. As a small business, you might be used to paying $30 or so a month for your accounting package. You may have got your accountants to set it up for you, or you may have done it yourself, but in any case, the cost of the software is negligible in the overall scheme of things. But not with the next step up. So for a five-year subscription term, a typical enterprise ERP solution will start somewhere in the region of $15,000 or so a year, and that's just for a very basic system. The cost of, for a value-added reseller or systems integrator to implement it can easily be double that cost too, and that's not even by a top-tier SI. Many of these ERP projects in small businesses stop almost as soon as they've started once the CFO has found out how much money they're looking at spending on them. The thing is though, that ERP solution is going to continue to support you for the next 15 years. So if your business is growing rapidly and your projections are showing you reaching 50, 100 or even 500 million in the next five years, it's worth getting onto an end state platform now whilst it's still easy to do. Cost, however, is not the only surprise. The second shock that many businesses frequently face is the amount of effort it takes to get onto a new system. You'll have typically been using the current system in your business for the past few years. Your team has grown and has grown used to using the software you have and the business processes you've developed along the way. Now you're asking them to throw that knowledge away. You want them to invest time to help define the future business needs and you want them to support the selection and implementation process. That's quite a big ask and frequently businesses want people to do this whilst they're all doing their normal day, day jobs as well. So Gartner reckon that nearly three out of four of these kind of projects fail. Every organization you see listed here has had an ERP project failure, which has ended up being reported in the press. Indeed, some companies have had more than one. And those are just the ones that get into the newspapers. Small projects go wrong equally as many times and often for many of the same reasons. These reasons can include overambition in the scope, unrealistic expectations, especially in the time it takes to deploy, inexperience in implementation. But one of the key reasons they go wrong is the project team puts too much emphasis on the technology and doesn't concentrate enough on the people. If you think about it, it makes perfect sense. It's the people who have the knowledge of the business, people who will work with you to work out what the new system needs to do and how to do it. People who will implement it, people who will end up being trained on it and using it in their daily lives, maybe for the next decade or more. And if you don't have the people who are impacted on board, and if the people you have got to implement it don't have as much experience as they've claimed, you'll have failed before you start. So the decision is not quite as simple as is it Microsoft or NetSuite? And even here, there are choices. You'll need to consider, have I set a suitable budget and estimated a suitable timeline for the project? Do I have enough bandwidth in my organization to actually implement it? 
which product is most likely to meet my needs in the medium to long term? Is there a product that better supports my industry sector? Can I get away with the light versions of NetSuite or Dynamics, or should I, should I go for the full fat? And finally, do I have the skills necessary to navigate my way through a procurement and implementation of this nature? If you'd like to discuss with us anything about what you've heard in this video, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at thirdstage.com and subscribe to our channel. So until the next time then, goodbye.